to me, the problem of evil is easy to answer. Uh, I, that's just all there is to it. We know, I argue that we know why God allows evil. What I call false starts to solving the problem of evil. Uh, and one of the ways you can do it is to simply make, well, you can make God less good and solve the problem of evil, or you can make God less powerful and solve the problem of evil. Open theism is the view that God does not know the future decisions of free beings, free creatures. He doesn't know what they're going to do. Uh, I think that's false. And I'll say, you know why I'm not going to jab this pen into my eye? Because I'm too smart for that. And that would be a stupid thing to do. Uh, and, and what we're learning here on planet Earth, and this is very important, is we're learning that sin is stupid. Eternity will dwarf our suffering here to insignificance. Hi there, welcome to the Carpenter's Desk, and today I'm glad to have with me Dr. Clay Jones. Dr. Jones is an associate professor of Christian apologetics at Talbot School of Theology. He is the former CEO of Simon Greenleaf University, now called the Trinity Law School. He serves as the chairman of the board of University Apologetics Ministry Ratio Christi and is a contributing writer to the Christian Research Journal. He is a specialist when it comes to the problem of evil and has authored two books. Uh, firstly, Why Does God Allow Evil? compelling answers for life's toughest questions, and most recently, immortal, how the fear of death drives us and what we can do about it. Welcome, Dr. Jones, to the Carpenter's Desk. My pleasure. Thank you for having me on, Asher. I had the pleasure of reading uh, your book, Why Does God Allow Evil, a month or two back. And since then, I was looking forward to bring you on to discuss this topic. And to the viewers, you know, if you, I mean, irrespective of our faith background, we may be an atheist, a Hindu, or Christian, or whatever. The problem of evil is a topic that concerns all of us. So hang around as we'll discuss uh, the problem of evil, the questions on eternity, hell, so on and so forth. This will be a very interesting conversation. Uh, and if you're actually interested in such conversations, uh, do not forget to subscribe and tap the bell icon for more. Uh, Dr. Jones, uh, firstly, you know, it would be good to start by defining the terms. What is the problem of evil? And when you're talking about the problem of evil, there is the logical problem of evil, and then there is the evidential problem of evil. Um, so could you just, you know, t survey us through the uh, problem of evil itself to begin with? The logical problem, I'll start with the logical problem of evil. The logical problem of evil is trying to show that there's actually an internal contradiction in uh, the belief that uh, belief about God, for instance, and here, here's a simple formation of the problem. If God is all good, he would desire to prevent evil. If he's all powerful, he'd be able to do what he desires, but evil exists. So either God is not all good or not all powerful, or he doesn't exist. That's the logical problem of evil, uh, trying to show that it's an internal contradiction. If the premises as they're normally stated were true, uh, then, then indeed God would either not be all good or not be all powerful or he wouldn't exist. Uh, however, uh, atheists no longer use this. I don't know that they use it in other countries, but they don't use it any longer, uh, at least in, in uh, the Western world. They don't use it any longer because people like Alvin Plantinga has successfully shown that just because you don't know why God allows, why a good God would allow evil, just because you don't know that doesn't mean that he doesn't have a good reason. Uh, and so atheists like William Rao and a whole host of other atheists have essentially get Mackey and a host of other atheists. They don't, they don't employ it anymore. They don't even use it. The evidential problem of evil, on the other hand, is just simply, okay, they'll, they'll say, okay, we're not trying to show that there's a logical contradiction in, in God allowing evil, but still, does it make sense? Basically, they're asking, does it make sense that God would allow all the evil that he allows in the world? And so that's the evidential problem of evil, and, and that very much uh, is being brought up. Uh, and so anyway, that's the de difference between those two. Yeah, so the, as far as I understand it, the evidential problem of evil would be more based on the probability. Right? Um, they would use the, that's right. the Bayesian probability to, uh, mm -hmm. to show that Given the the uh, 
the problem of evil that we see, the odds of God's existence is low. That's right. That's right. So, Dr. Jones, what are they missing when they're when they're kind of calculating this probability? What what you know? Well, I think God has very good reasons for allowing evil, and that, of course, is much of what my book is about, is showing, in fact, if not all of it, showing that God has good reasons for allowing evil. Uh, and one of those is that he wants to reveal to humankind the horror, the, the tragedy, the travesty of rebellion against him, that, he, that when people rebel against God, it's just, it's horrific what has resulted in, when not just humans, but when any being has rebels against God, it re has resulted in all the death and all the murder, all the suffering, <clears throat> in fact, just even all the COVID-19s uh, and everything is a result of humans' rebellion against God. One way or another, uh, every, every evil thing that happens is the result of, of human rebellion or creaturely rebellion against God. And that's, so that's the short answer. I would say it's the result of creaturely sin, okay. because we, we believe that Satan and, and uh, some of the angels rebelled against God before humans did. And so, and of course, they're not human. And so we're, it's the result of creaturely sin. And so we define, by the way, evil as a misuse of the free will. Uh, that's what evil is. Evil is not a blob that's somewhere in the universe. There's not this blob out there somewhere and we call that blob evil. There's no blob in the universe or being in the universe that is evil personified. What there is, is there's the misuse of creaturely freedom, and that's, that's what evil is. Now, some beings, like Satan, have completely given themselves over to evil. But, but that's, that's, anyway, so just to make sure people understand, there's no, because people are like, why does God, why does God allow this, be, this blob in the universe to exist that, we call evil. Well, there is, there's nothing like that. Evil is a misuse of the free will. And that leads to that God values free will. And here's something that's as logical as it gets, Asher, and that is you cannot give a creature free will and not allow them to use their free will wrongly. That's as logical as it gets. You, you haven't given them free will. I like to say you can't tell your daughter that she can go out on a date with a punk down the street and then chain her to a heavy kitchen appliance. That's not giving her free will. And so free will entails, it's absolutely necessary that you allow creatures to use their free will wrongly. And so here we are. As you rightly pointed out, uh, you know, evil is not something that exists in some part of the universe, but it's a result of creaturely free will. But then I've heard this question about why did God allow Satan to continue in his in, in existence even after he committed that act of sin, so to speak. Uh, this is a question that even little children would have. How would you answer, you know, how do we make sense of the existence of Satan? Satan is just a creature like any other creature like you and me. Uh, it's just that he was a very powerful creature, a very significant creature, and he used his free will to rebel against God. Now, people, the question that people ask is, and apparently he was able to convince a number of angels to follow him. Uh, the scripture says in Revelation that the third of the stars were swept out of the sky. Uh, mo and I don't know any commentators in Revelation that don't think that stars represent angels. Uh, but anyway, it doesn't matter how many, but he was able to get some angels to go with him. He was able to convince some angels to go with him. Now, what is... And apparently he was making arguments against God's goodness, as far as uh, we can see, that God was not giving Satan all that Satan thought that he deserved. And so Satan rebelled. What was God to do when Satan rebelled? He could have destroyed him immediately. It's, it's no question there. He could have destroyed Satan and all of the angels immediately. But what would the lesson be to free creatures? The lesson to free creatures then would simply be, uh, might makes right. Uh, you dis you rebel against me. I don't care what your arguments are, and I will destroy you. I will obliterate you. But I don't. But what if the Lord wants to not just destroy evil creatures, but He wants to do something to make the other beings, the other creatures, realize that 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 Satan's wrong, uh, that evil's bad. Well, I think He does that as He's doing that now. He's allowing creatures to say, basically to say, you know, I don't think you're right, God. 
about this or that or the other thing. And he, I don't know that this is an expression that's familiar to you so much in, in India, but in the United States, we have an expression when kids <clears throat> get really, want to do something really bad. Sometimes a, a parent might say, well, okay, go ahead and knock yourself out. Uh, you know, go ahead and just try it out and see how it works for you. And, and I think that that's really what the Lord is doing. He's saying, so you don't think my ways are just, you don't think my ways are right. Well, have at it then. See what happens to you when you decide to go your own way. And so that, uh, so the Lord couldn't just, well, he could have destroyed Satan. There's nothing stopping him. But I think that it, he realized, that, again, it was better to let Satan, in a sense, continue to exist. And then the Lord to use Satan and other creatures that followed him as an example of the significance and the horror of rebellion against God. Then the natural question arises, uh, could there have been some other way of creating, you know, uh, beings, uh, both human and angels, in a way that they would not sin? Well, that, that's one of the biggest questions in this whole discussion. Was, was there another way? Uh, and I talk about that at length in my book, Why Does God Allow Evil? Was there another way? Did, is there something else he could have done? And I give a lot of different, you know, what people suggest is he could have done this, or he could have done that, or he could have done that. Uh, and and uh, I, I think the answer to that is, well, my, and, and this, this I've, I've made actually a lot of people mad when I do this to them, uh, or at the very least frustrated. Uh, when people say to me, well, God should have done something else, that what he's done by allowing all this horror in the universe is it's too much. He should have done something else. And I reply to them like 100% of the time. I say, okay, tell, tell you what, you cannot without removing free will, because if you remove free will, I can get rid of all evil too. That's not a problem. Without removing free will, tell me how does God uh, create a universe uh, where there is either uh, no evil or at least significantly less evil than there is now. How does he do that? But you can't remove free will. And I'll tell you, the response is, all well, almost 100%. I don't know. I'm not God. Well, I think that is a cop-out. Uh, I think that's just simply ridiculous. I mean, if you can't think of a way, because see what they're saying is, I can't think of a way for that to happen. I don't know of a way for God to eliminate evil or at least reduce it significantly uh, without taking away free will. Well, if that's the case, maybe it's not possible. And so then we're back to, well, free will is valuable and God has given us as creatures free will. And so I think that's the, you know, the answer to that. So every time, uh, Dr. Jones, when we talk about free will, the, the question that arises is on the sovereignty of God. Uh, so if man is actually free, how, what, do we, what do we make of God's sovereignty? Does God actually, I mean, when God created Adam, or when even God created Lucifer, Satan, did he not know already that this is going to happen? How do we really understand God's sovereignty and man's free will? Well, of course, God did know that this would happen, but that's the price of creating free beings <clears throat> or free creatures. I had a student in my class once. I, always, I usually use free creatures. I had a student, last day of class, the class not only had ended, I think we closed in prayer and a student raised her hand and says, what's a free being? And I'm like, what? Uh, she didn't know. She thought maybe I was talking about a lima bean or a green bean. or Anyway, I, free B-E-I-N-G, free bean or free creature. Anyway, uh, you know, the, the price of allowing free creatures is that they're going, they're, going to use their, they're going to use their free will wrongly. Uh, and that's just simply the price of uh, creating free beings. You just simply cannot eliminate evil and actually have created free beings and allow them to use their free will wrongly. Uh, and so, you know, but like I say, people, they fumble, you know, around trying to think of there's got to have been a way. Well, th let me know what it is because I'm all ears. And as I say in my book, I go through and debunk a lot of, you know, all of their ideas. None of them work, but they always get frustrated with me and always just because, well, God knows more than I do. Well, then, well, maybe there's no way. Uh, for God to do it without just simply allowing free beings, free creatures to act out their evil desires so that he can teach them, reveal to them the horror of rebellion against him. Yeah, so I, I think that, you know, if you're not, if you're watching this and you've not actually read Dr. Jones's book, you should have it on your shelf because, you know, what, what the book does is that it breaks these 
big issues into topic in, into questions and each chapter is an answer to a question and then that is actually then further split into sub questions and all of the questions that you have is beautifully answered in dr jones's book uh, dr jones because we have talked about free will and god sovereignty i've also seen uh, some people offer some kind of views that that are called open open theism uh, where you know, they tend to say that well you know when god created adam or god created man god did not know what was going to come how how would you respond to this um, open view of the future right well uh you know in my, in my book i go through uh false starts what i call false starts to solving the problem of evil uh, and one of the ways you can do it is to simply make, well, you can make God less good and solve the problem of evil, or you can make God less powerful and solve the problem of evil. And open theism is a way of saying basically God isn't as powerful as Christians typically conceive of him. Uh, and, 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 other, and open theism is the view that God does not know the future decisions of free beings, free creatures. He doesn't know what they're going to do. Uh, I think that's false. I think there's a number of places in scripture uh, that, that suggests that he does know exactly what creatures are going to do, how creatures are going to act. Uh, and so I, I reject that view as just simply being unbiblical. I think if you read through the scripture carefully, you'll see that, that well, that the Lord knows what people are going to do before they do it. He's not, he's not caught off guard. He's not surprised. And he knew that Adam and uh, Satan were going to fall. But again, uh, he wants to reveal to creatures the horror of rebellion. This is a little bit premature, perhaps. But let me just say that when people do this, they go, so all this evil, all this suffering that's going on is because God created these creatures anyway, knowing this was going to happen. Remember something. And this is something that I cannot emphasize enough, in fact, I've just started a nonprofit ministry called Live for Eternity, is that it's not just about this life. Christianity is about eternity, and we're going to live forever and ever and ever and ever, and, and eternity will dwarf our suffering here to insignificance. And so anyway, I just, I, I just bring that up maybe a little bit early just to say we need to understand God is revealing to free creatures the horror of rebellion but this is eternally valuable knowledge. Yeah, I think that uh, you're actually getting there. So something that you kind of repeat in your book is a statement that eternity will dwarf uh, our sufferings. Uh, you know, so people often, you know, when, you look, when you're living in the present, right, when you're losing a loved one or when you're going through a disaster <clears throat> and all of these things, we often, uh, you know, raise this question. Of, so I think that, it's it very less that in our actual lives we won't really intellectualize suffering or evil. You know, it's it's more about emotions and the way we feel about it. So how do how does the Christian view of evil you know, with respect to eternity factor into? How does you said how does the Christian view of evil and eternity factor in? Is that what you said? Yeah. I, okay. Uh, well, uh, Christians, unfortunately, I don't know how it is in. That as much in the East, but I can tell you in the West, uh, very, very few Christians in the West think much about eternity. Uh, most Christians that I know are this world focused. Uh, because they're this world focused, it's tremendously damaging to their Christian experience. Uh, and frankly, it, it leads to a lot of sin and, and, and a lot of questions about God. Because if, if this law, if Christianity is primarily about this life, if it's primarily about this life, then uh, I don't know how you answer the problem of evil either. I don't know why God would allow evil if Christianity is primarily about this life. But we don't believe that. We as Christians don't believe that. Uh, when somebody dies, you go, well, death is such a horrible thing. It is Christianity, one, not just 101, it's Christianity 100. It's even more basic than that, that all Christians believe uh, well, at least those who actually believe Jesus really was raised from the dead Christians, believe that when you die, it does not end your existence. When you die, it just ends your existence on earth. You're going to go on and live forever. And so we're all going to live. We're all going to live forever and ever and ever and ever. And we cannot lose sight of that because if you do, you're going to be very confused about what Christianity is. 
So yeah, so when you actually add the the Christian doctrine of eternity in the denominator, uh, you know this this problem of evil. I think you actually start your book. I think if I remember correctly, where you say that, well, this giant problem of evil that is often presented, I don't actually see the problem of evil itself. <clears throat> well, yeah, as when I was a young pastor uh, in in the nineteen early nineteen eighties, uh, I began to just began to realize the glory that awaits us in heaven forever. And that knowledge was so incredibly and utterly significant to me that the idea that we're, you know, that we're going to be glorified. And so I be that became the major focus of my study. And then after a while, I decided that I would start studying, you know, after some years, as a matter of fact, I decided, well, I know where we're going. Where did we come from? And so I just start, decided to start studying the nature of humankind. And in particular, I studied genocide and mass murder. And when I understood the depths of human sinfulness and the glory that God was bringing us to, uh, frankly, the, the problem of evil is just, it, it grew very small to me. I just, I be, because it all, it made sense. Uh, and a famous expositor, London expositor, D. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, he says, most of our problems are due to a double failure. We fail on the one hand to understand the depths of human sinfulness, and we fail on the other hand to understand the wonder, the glory of what awaits us in heaven forever. And I think that's absolutely correct. And my book focuses, much of my book focuses on those two things, the desperate nature of humankind without God, and then the glory that God's going to bring us into. And when I realized those things, uh, the problem of evil grew very small to all, basically, I don't, frankly, uh, I, I don't even think there is such a thing anymore. I mean, I real, I, I, I'm hesitant to say this because I don't want to freak people out. But to me, the problem of evil is easy to answer. Uh, I, that's just all there is to it. We know, I argue that we know why God allows evil. I mean, I think the Bible tells us why God allows evil. Uh, it's, but because we don't understand the depths of human sinfulness and we hardly at all contemplate the glory uh, of what's going to happen to us forever, because we don't understand those two things, uh, then, then uh, the, the problem of evil, you know, just looms large. But when we do, it becomes rather relatively small. Sin and eternity, I, I see there. So I want to actually talk on eternity a bit, you know, later. But before we get there, Sin and eternity, that, that, those are kind of, you know, very crucial aspects about Christian faith. So, Dr. Jones, how does the Christian understanding and the response to the problem of evil differ from other religious worldviews, particularly, you know, the Eastern karmic religions, especially Hinduism and all of these things? Yeah, I, you know, it's, well, it's funny. My next book, uh, as a matter of fact, and here it is, Immortal, How the Fear of Death Drives Us and What We Can Do About It. Uh, actually deals a lot with B Buddhism and Hinduism uh, because it's this, I didn't know this until I wrote the book, actually. But a tremendous amount of Western scholars have adopted uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, as you know, Buddhism is just an offshoot of Hinduism, but they've adopted this into their philosophies. Arthur Schopenhauer, uh, for instance, was big. I thought the uh, the Vedas were sublime. Uh, Einstein was a follower of Schopenhauer. Einstein thought, uh, for instance, said, your individual existence is a delusion. That, that was just amazing to me, uh, to think that, in, that even Einstein would say, your individual uh, existence is a delusion. He said, it takes a very advanced mind to realize that. Well, that's dumb, uh, frankly. That's just a dumb idea. But... Uh, but but is it because a, a you know uh, by the way Stoic this, a lot of the Greek philosophers bought into reincarnation. Many of the Greek philosophers thought that reincarnation was true, uh, and so uh, but but this anyway the difference the big difference is of course is that we you know I, I've in studying this and and I've spent a lot of time now studying and I've talked to some uh, I talked to a Buddhist professor and so on. But it's interesting to me because really what is being offered out there by Hinduism and Buddhism is what? Uh, the, you, you finally, your existence uh, ceases. You're absorbed into whatever you want to call it, uh, but your individual consciousness ceases. Uh, and, and I think that's just 
well, I think that's kind of sad. And what you're looking for, of course, is the end of redeath and rebirth, you know, and, and I, Jeannie and I, when we were, we, we had a chance to, I had a chance to speak in Singapore. And so we went to Singapore and there was a Buddhist temple, a huge four story Buddhist temple in Singapore. And on the third floor, there was this like, well, every, every floor, it was basically a shrine, but there, there was this Buddhist monk who was sitting in the corner and he's, he's in the lotus position and he's, he's, he's just looking at the corner. And I thought, well, man, because by the way, the Buddhists that I've read say you cannot, there's no way you're going to escape the cycle of rebirth and redeath without being a monk. You, you'll never be able to free yourself from desire enough. And I'm sitting there looking at this guy who's, who's, who's facing the corner of this building and thinking, man, yeah, I mean, what kind of existence is that? And why is he doing that? Because he wants to escape the cycle of rebirth and redeath, uh, you know, and of course, as, as you probably know, though, we, you know, I mean, I, we think it's always rather bizarre because, you know, I'm, one of the tenets is that desire is evil. And so what you need to do is you need to escape all desire. <laughs> well, you need to desire to escape all desire. <laughs> I mean, why? And, and because you don't, because you desire to escape the cycle of rebirth and redeath. <clears throat> Look, Christianity has something much better than that. You can, when you die, you can go off and be with your loved ones, be reunited with your Christian loved ones forever. You're not just absorbed into some sort of, you know, cosmic whatever. You're, you can be forever conscious and enjoy the presence of people that you know that are Christians forever and ever and ever. So I don't, I mean, to me, there's no comparison in what you get uh, and, and I think that seeing that Buddhist monk made me think that, you know, what you have going on there is I'm going to make my life so miserable here that I really don't care about dying because I've, I mean, it's like a living death. Well, what kind of existence is that? And like I say, and why is he doing it? Because he desires to escape his fear of re death and rebirth. Well, that's anyway, I just don't, there's nothing there for me. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I see the difference and basically, uh, you know, even when you're talking about uh, the origin of the problem of evil and uh, even the solution of the problem of evil, uh, I don't think that, you know, the, the karmic religions actually solve for the problem of evil no. that we see in, in Christ. By the way, let me just say, since, you know, I mean, you're an Indian, you know this, but uh, church history, Christians believe that that it was the Apostle Thomas that brought Christianity to India no later than 62 AD. Uh, so it's not, you know, it's not like, well, how come Christianity never got to India? It got to India by one of the original apostles in the first century. Right. Uh, in fact, it got to India, it got to India probably before it got to Europe. Uh, right. And uh, I mean, possibly anyway, it certainly got to India long before it got to the United States. Uh, so anyway, I think that's just an important point. So Dr. Jones, um, we have talked about the difference between the other worldviews and Christianity, and you know, I just want to get into the aspect of eternity. Uh, before I get to the point of heaven, let's talk about hell, you know, because there's already a lot of talk online about different views on hell, even among Christians. And while atheist skeptics, they feel that the notion of hell itself is not justified what is the biblical notion of hell? You know, well, we state that and then we can go on to defend. Right. Well, let me say out at the outset that most theologians do not think that the depictions of hell are, most of them anyway, are literal. Uh, we do not believe, for instance, that the fires of hell are such that they could drive a steam engine. We don't think that that's what hell is about the reformers did not set out right that the, that in the scripture, God's not trying to teach us the chemistry of hell, uh, the physics of hell. Uh, when Jesus said that hell was a place where the worm does not die and, and the fires do not cease, they do not end, everybody that I know, I don't know of any Christian theologians, not one that doesn't think that Jesus was being metaphorical when he mentioned that the worm does not die. I don't know of any Christians who think that that was not just a metaphor. 
uh, well, it would be odd if Jesus was being metaphorical when he said, uh, where the worm does not die and the fires are not quenched, that he'd be metaphorical regarding the worm and then talk in, in, the, in the same breath almost, uh, then say, and the fires are not quenched without those also being metaphorical. And so we need to realize at the outset that I don't know what hell is going to be like, but the point is it's not a place you want to go. That's what Jesus is trying to communicate. You don't want to go there. Uh, it's going to be bad. Now, uh, I agree with C.S. Lewis. I think that there's a very real sense that the gates of hell are locked from the inside. And I'll just give you an example. Jeannie and I were not able to have children. Um, <clears throat> so we took in foster children. We took in preteen and teenage foster children. Uh, one, one, one day, uh, a 12-year-old girl, one of our 12-year-olds ran away from home. Uh, and we, I think that was the first night in my life that I actually didn't sleep for one moment. I, I literally did not sleep for a second. We got out of bed that next morning, but I had not fallen asleep. Well, anyway, uh, we followed her life through knowing what her, her relatives and stuff, we could kind of figure out where she was go going and what she was doing. A, a year later, almost a year, exactly a year later, she called us and Jeannie answered the phone and started talking to her and Jeannie said to her, and she said, I've ruined my childhood, right? Because she was basically living on the streets, living in one cheap apartment or hotel after another. Uh, we know for a fact she was being very sexually promiscuous. But Jeannie says, why did you run away? And she said, because you wouldn't let me have a boyfriend. Well, she was 12. She was 12 years old. And yeah, we weren't going to let a 12-year-old have a boyfriend. Uh, we actually even offered for her to come back and live with us again. We, she had to get back into the system. She had to go to a county home. But we said that would probably only take a few days, but you'd need to be back in the system. You can't use our house as, as just a hotel. And she actually declined it, said no, she wasn't interested. Now, she had her own room uh, that had beautiful furniture. Because of our foster girls, we had a pool table in the, one of our, you know, in our three-car garage, we had a pool table. We had a jacuzzi in the backyard because we wanted the kids to spend time at our house. She had, from a worldly perspective, everything that you could imagine. But what she didn't have was the ability to do whatever she wanted to do whenever she wanted to do it. Uh, and uh, we, of course, to this moment, I wouldn't have changed. I wouldn't say, oh, if I'd known you were going to run away, I'd let you have a boyfriend at 12. <laughs> that would be insanity. Uh, but notice, and I think this is a good analogy, notice that she, her preference, but most of us would consider that living on the streets uh, is pretty close to hell. You don't actually have a home to live in. You don't have a bed. You don't have a place to live in. We would think that's pretty close to hell, but she preferred that if, as long as she could do her own thing. And I think that's a description of the, the of people in hell. I really do. I think the, the point of the matter is uh, they don't want to be with God. Sure, they'd be glad to be with God. In fact, it would be their preference if, if they could do whatever they wanted to do. Absolutely. But the Lord's not going to simply let them do whatever they want to do in his kingdom. That's just simply not an option. And so I think it's true. I think Lewis was right. They'd prefer to be away from him than to be have to do what he says to do. Yeah, wow. I think that, that illustration is quite powerful. And uh, but Dr. Jones, here's the thing, you know. Let's say, I mean, these people are going to hell. But how would you just justify... Or do you really think that the eternal view of hell is fair? How could we justify the thing that they will spend their eternity in hell for the finite sins they do on earth? Well, I, you know, I think that the what we're going to find with the occupants of hell is they're going to be eternally unrepentant. Uh, that it's not like I, I don't think there will be one person, and and I talk about this and give some analogies on this uh, in my book, but I don't think there will be any any creatures in hell that are going, oh, God, I didn't know. It's so bad. I wish I'd made the decision. It was between vanilla and chocolate, and I chose chocolate, and who knows, God wanted me to choose vanilla, and I should have. I don't think there's going to be one creature like that. I think we're going to see creatures in hell that will be forever in rebellion against him. Uh, as William Ernest Henley, a famous uh, Stoic philosopher, put it, he said, 
you know, matters not how straight the gate, and he's talking about the heavenly gates, nor charged with punishments the scroll. I'm the master of my fate, and I'm the captain of my soul. What's he saying? I, you can send me to hell if you want to, but I'm not going to repent. I'm not going to do your will. Well, there's a lot, I think, in the hell, once, once the judgment comes and people's hearts are revealed for what they really are, we're going to find that that's the case for everybody in hell, that they simply don't want to do God's will, even as it's offered to them. There's no chance that they're going to want to do God's will. I think C.S. Lewis does a good job dealing with that in his book, The Great Divorce, by the way. I think that's a great book to read on that subject. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in fact, today itself I saw on Facebook, you know, a quote by Dan Barker, the atheist, floating around, which where he was kind of saying that even if, you know, I was convinced that Jesus lived, died, and rose again, I would not be willing to accept him as my Lord and you know, leave under the demands. So I think this kind of resonates with what most of the skeptics would yeah. actually say uh, on the sovereignty of God. Right. Yeah, so, yeah exactly. I, uh, and all I can say is, is uh, he is saying basically that I, when, when non-Christian skeptics come to me and they say, I can't believe that God would create a hell. What they're, I, I think that they, they use it as an intellectual argument but I think really down deep in their hearts, what's really going on is they're saying, I'm very upset that God's going to send me there. And when I talk, when skeptics bring, you know, argue this with me, I say, but don't you understand? You don't have to go there. Uh, they're just using the existence of hell as an excuse to not believe and saying, well, see, he's really not good. He's plenty good. Uh, and the, and if, you're go, if you go to hell, it would be because you decided not to become the kind of person that wants to be with God. Definitely. I mean, for the viewers, again, you know, if you I think one of my favorite chapters in the book was Dr. Jones, uh, the chapter on the fairness of the eternal view of hell. I think that really helped me personally. I think that, you know, it, that's something that y'all should definitely read. But now let's talk about heaven, the eternity, uh, the other side of eternity. And, uh, you know, there are several myths about heaven that Christians have. The most yes. popular one is that, you know, what even some very much believing Christians would have is that, wouldn't heaven be really boring? You'd be worshiping yes. God all the time, singing. Well, right. I, I uh, as you said, I give a bunch of myths. Uh, I, or you could even call them lies, because I think this is, I think this is some of Satan's absolutely best work, is to distort the nature of heaven into a place that you wouldn't want to go. Years ago, I had a young, well, I was a, 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 a sophomore in university, sophomore come up to me, and she fought back tears as she confessed to me that she was afraid she didn't want to go to heaven. And I, this is probably 15 years ago, and I was like, whoa, really? I mean, that kind of surprised me to have that come out of her mouth. So I went in and talked to one of the women in our department, uh, one of the women who, who did, did as was an assistant in our department. She says, I have the same fear. She was in her twenties. I have the same fear. Uh, and of, over the, as the years have gone by, I've realized many people are actually afraid of going to heaven. And that's because, as I said, I think this is some of Satan's best work. Uh, he's, he makes heaven into a place where it looks like what we're going to do is sit on a cloud all day. Well, 24 hours a day, we're going to be sporting flightless wings. We're going to be strumming harps and we're going to be singing nonstop. Well, that sounds terrible to me. Uh, I don't, I, that just sounds awful. I don't want to do that. That's just a terrible, we're going to be cloud potatoes, but that's none of those things are what the scripture teaches. One of the myths, for instance, is that heaven is white. Well, if you look at this, read Revelation, if anything, Heaven is jewel-toned. If you're going to give it a color, heaven is jewel-toned. It's not white. Uh, you know, I mean, we're not going to be on clouds. That's not what the Bible teaches. And by the way, we're not going to sing nonstop. The Bible doesn't teach that either. Uh, our occupation is reigning with Christ. It's not singing. Uh, I'm sure we will sing because that is the natural result of, of experiencing something wonderful. As you, you know, I mean... Uh, you sing about it, but I'm sure we will be worshiping and singing, but that's not our major occupation. That's not the only thing we're going to do. Uh, and and so anyway, there's all these things. And like I said, I think this is some of Satan's very best work to make heaven go like, it's not really good enough uh, to ha for Christians to regard heaven as no more than, well, at least it's not the other place. That's, 
that's not a compelling place you want to go. Well, it's not hell. So I guess we'll go to heaven because it's not hell. It sure sounds really bad. Uh, and, and so, you know, all of these things are just simply not true. In fact, I call it, we have a, had a show here in America called Extreme Makeover. Um, and I call it, I call what we have here in, uh, with this, I call it Extreme Makeover Metaphysical Edition, uh, where Satan has made heaven look like a place you wouldn't want to go, but hell is a place of eternal merriment. Uh, that's Satan's work. And, uh, and I think Christians need to be set straight on that because that's just a terrible notion. I, the biggest thing for me about heaven is, and I think this is hugely important, is in the Old and New Testaments, heaven is most likened to a banquet. Now, I don't know anybody that doesn't like to eat and drink. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, heaven is most often in Scripture uh, compared to a banquet. Now, that's not all we're going to be doing. We're not going to just be banqueting. But certainly, that's one of the things that we're going to be doing in heaven, because um, the scripture, well, like I say, it most often compares it to a banquet. We're invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Right? We're invited to a banquet. By the way, uh, marriage ceremonies, weddings in, in first century Israel, uh, the, the, the uh, festivities lasted for a full seven days. Uh, and so when people, when, when they were out of wine, and Jesus' mother says, they're out of wine, and Jesus makes wine, if you look into this, he made somewhere, he made these, these big giant jars of wine, he made somewhere between 120 and 150 gallons of wine, 120 to 150 gallons of it. Um, uh, you know, I mean, but we just, you know, I mean, uh, sex, the, the joy, who created the pleasure of sex? It was God, guess what? He created the pleasure of sex. And you mentioned then, Asher, the, the verse, you know, in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. I mean, for crying out loud, uh, I mean, he created all the pleasures. There are no pleasures uh, that God didn't create. In fact, C.S. Lewis in his book, The Screwtape Letters, one screw tape is a senior tempter, senior demon, basically writing to a junior tempter on how to tempt Christians. He says, the enemy, that's God, that's God in that book. Uh, he says, the enemy's made all the pleasures. We haven't made any of them, although we're working on it. We're trying to create a pleasure. Uh, so so I, I, people need to understand that heaven's going to be a place of immense pleasure. Uh, and, and I just, you know, that's what the scripture actually does teach. It's just we Christians, unfortunately, we read the scripture too, too quickly to, without really thinking it through. Uh, for instance, the seraphs, it says in Revelation that the seraphs never cease to sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. <clears throat> and they go, oh, so I guess we're, not, we're never going to cease singing. That's not right. Uh, uh, if you read further in Revelation, you'll find that the seraphs are, sing, are doing things where they're not singing. You'll find that the seraphs are, uh, is, uh, and also they're not just singing that song. Sometimes they're singing other songs, but there's sometimes that they're not singing at all. Um, and, and see, but we read the scripture too, too quickly without really thinking it through. And so as a result, we don't understand what's really going on. And, the, and, and I just emphasize again, uh, heaven's going to be a place of eternal pleasure, as David said, in your right hand are pleasures forevermore, as you, as you put it. Would we really have free will in heaven, Dr. Jones? You know, if, if it's, a, it's going to be an eternity that we're going to en enjoy, uh, is there a possibility of sin that is still left in heaven? No, I, I go through, in my book, I go through seven reasons why we will have free will in heaven and not sin. And one of them, by the way, and I'll just use this as an illustration, because this is one of the most important, is I'll talk to my classes or talk to audiences. I've spoken, hopefully, maybe the next time I get out to Asia, I'll be able to stop by India. But, but um, uh, I'll say to people, would you like to see me jab this pen into my eye? I could do it. I could just jab it right into my eye. And people, when I say this to them, they're always a little bit like, kind of like, what? This is freaky. Why are you saying, you know, I go, I could do it. I could jab it right into my eye. But then I'll say, you know why I'm not going to jab this pen into my eye? Because I'm too smart for that. And that would be a stupid thing to do. Uh, and, and what we're learning here on planet Earth, and this is very important, is we're learning that sin is stupid. That it's a stupid thing to sin against God. That's just simply a stupid thing to do. Uh, and at the judgment, 
where everyone's sins are going to be revealed, not the, not the Christian sins. Your sins are covered by the blood of Jesus, but where the non-Christian sins are revealed for what they are, and where the skeptics' motives are revealed for what they really are, that it's not that they really had this intelligent knockdown argument against Christianity. What they really had was the fact that they wanted to do their own thing, which is often, by the way, they wanted to be sexually promiscuous uh, as they could possibly be. Uh, when their motives are revealed and when we see uh, how horrible sin is, that's going to be a further clarification to us of the horror of rebellion against God. We're going to take this knowledge with us up into heaven, and that's eternally valuable knowledge. And by the way, another reason I've got, like I said, I mentioned seven, another is hell will be, hell will be an eternal reminder to free creatures of the horror of rebellion against him. And so, uh, yeah, I, I, I argue that we are going to have free will in heaven, but we aren't going to sin. Uh, and, but the reason we're not going to sin is largely because of the horror that we're experiencing here on planet Earth and the explanation, the further horror that we're going to experience at watching people be judged. I think when the scripture says, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, uh, my wife Jeannie was the one that pointed this out to me, will probably be more, almost certainly after the judgment uh, that he'll wipe away every tear from our eyes because the judgment's going to be a horrific thing as we learn all the horrors that people have uh, perpetrated upon each other. And like I say, when we really see the skeptic's heart revealed, we're going to see that they really didn't have a knockdown argument against Christianity, but it was really about them wanting to live in their own sinfulness. Thank you so much, Dr. Jones, for coming along and, you know, you took up all of these questions you had and you spent time with us. Thank you so much. It's been my pleasure to be with you, Asher. Thank you.